Thanks for coming everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome Peter Shuff. He's going to give you a little talk about his art. He's going to play some songs for you. If you've got any questions throughout, just raise your hand. It's going to be like a relaxed sort of, yeah. sort of thing. So. Peter Shuff, everyone. Right. Can, can you all hear me? <laughs> can I do it without the microphone? Yes? Um, uh, are are you are, are, are you guys art students or music students? Both. Both. What? Both. Okay. Because um, I I mean I don't I'm really used to giving talks about my paintings. I've I've done that a lot. I can do it blindfolded. Yeah. Um, but now all of a sudden, uh, you, you know, I, I'm here for the in Preston for the for the music, and. Um, and in the last few months, I keep being asked to reconcile the two of them, to the music and, and the paintings, and it, which is uh, virtually impossible. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I say, like, uh, paintings I make during the day and music I make in the evening, you know? Um, so I figured today I'd just, I'd just sort of t tell you my life story real quick, right? Um, and then we'll we'll see if 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 somehow we can find a way to reconcile the uh, the daytime and the evening activities. Um, I was born in the Netherlands. We immigrated uh, in in '58. We immigrated to um, to North America first to Vancouver, Canada, in uh, 1966, um, and. Uh, my parents were hippies. Um, I went, you know, I grew up and wanted to go to art school, right? Um, I made it through about one semester, and uh, at that point, I, I st just started making art on my own. When I was really, really young, uh, I started hanging out at this sort of alternative space in, in Vancouver. It was a, like a not-for-profit, artist-run uh, gallery called uh, the Western Front, which was run by, um, these two guys, uh, M Michael Morris and Vincent Trasoff. Vincent Trasoff was famous. Here he is. Here are pictures of Vincent. Um, maybe we could turn the lights down just a little bit. Uh, Vincent was famous for having run for mayor. As an artwork, he ran for mayor in Vancouver dressed as Mr. Peanut. Um, another artist, a wonderful artist called John Mitchell, a sculptor, was his campaign manager. Um, he needed uh, his spokesman. Of course, peanuts can't talk, so uh, the whole campaign was, it was one big performance. Uh, and so that sort of, that was my art school. There's, there's John up at the top there in the, and Vincent got a surprising amount of votes. It, it actually kind of went from being a lark to, to being something quite serious. This was, Jimmy Carter was the president of the states. Of course, Jimmy Carter was a peanut farmer. So they became friends. Uh, he met the Pope. Mr. Peanut met the Pope. I was there. Um, William Burroughs uh, endorsed our campaign. You can see him up there, second row down. Um, Mr. Mr. Peanut. Anyway, that sort of that was my that was my art school. That's what I sort of knew about art. And then I'm I um, another person I met through the Western Front. This uh, this artist-run space was a guy called Ray Johnson. Ray Johnson. Some people have credited Ray Johnson with being the very first pop artist. He started making uh, like that James Dean piece that you see up there with the Lucky Strike images up in the top there. Um, that's from, I think, 1957. Uh, so he, he very early on, he started making pop-like images. And he um, lived in New York, and, and he was kind of famous. And he did this thing called mail art. And through the Western Front, I, s I s started sending him letters, and he started sending me these letters back, like, like those black and white pieces. Those are things you would receive in the mail from, from Ray Johnson. And for me, they were like bona fide works of art, like original artworks from New York. I had this sort of, uh, this mecca vision of, of New York. And, and so Ray was my first tactile 
tactile connection with with New York where I, I wanted to go very, very badly. Um, Meanwhile, I hadn't gone to art school, but, but I was just, I was so ambitious. Do you know what I mean? I was so ambitious. And, and uh, I climbed and clawed my way uh, to, to New York, finally. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, w I went to New York um, and, um, and became a painter. I don't know what else to tell you about the, the route there, but yeah, I went to New York became a painter. I guess I went at, at sort of exactly the right time and I became a really trendy uh, 80s, yeah, 80s geometric uh, artist. Oh, let's see if I can... Okay, th these, are, these are some of those early, early paintings that I did when when I became kind of, you know, when I had my moment in, in New York, these are the paintings that I uh, was very well known for, uh, for, for a time. Um, they, were, they were sold before I finished painting them. I just, I, I couldn't paint them fast enough. Um, these things are big. They're 90 inches tall and uh, 66 inches across. They're acrylic on linen. Um, anyway, I became very successful uh, uh, with these for, for a time. And... Uh-oh. <coughs> what else can I tell you about these? Uh, when I, when I, uh, at this point, things became kind of serious, and I started painting these geometric paintings. They're all, they're about the same size. These are 10 feet square. You know, I said I'm really used to giving lectures on my paintings, but right now I'm just stumped. I don't know what to tell you about these things. <laughs> I'm completely flummoxed. Acrylic on uh, on linen. I told you that already, though. <laughs> These are um, this. Uh, Dennis Hopper bought this one, uh, and and he it, you can see it in the background. It, he gave whenever he did interviews and stuff. He loved sitting in front of it. So if you go looking at Dennis Hopper interviews, you can. This painting was called Weld, which uh, I always had these, when I did title a painting, which is quite rarely, I would, I would have these lofty titles, Weld, which I thought it was a bit like world with a speech impediment. <coughs> these are 10 feet square, and can you kind of see what's happening there? You can't really see. This is, like these are divided up into 120 by 120 little tiny squares and you know each one is a different color. They're easier to paint than they look. And for me it's always been a bit of a, a, a process like a, like a magic trick. Um, all these paintings I showed, uh, you know, I was a part of um, uh, even one of the stars of what was called the East Village scene at that time. The East Village is like a, a ghetto in, in Manhattan where all of a sudden, you know, sort of at, at the birth of like the graffiti days, Keith Haring, uh, Basquiat, all this happened in the East Village. And uh, it was really a process of gentrification. We kind of moved in and, and turned old bodegas and stuff into uh, galleries. That it, eventually ended up moving into Soho and then into Chelsea and, and so on. Um, at this time I was showing with, with really the, the very best gallery in the East Village, Pat Hearn. Um, and she, be, she, she died quite a few years ago, but she became really a legendary, legendary uh, dealer. Um, this show here, this was at the Leo Castelli Gallery. Anybody heard of the Leo Castelli Gallery? You got a question? Uh, 
if I really got going from like after the painting was after the the, the it's primed and all ready to go, maybe a uh, couple of days. Yeah, a couple of days. That's kind of hard to say. I mean, at that time, I had people working in my studio, so you know. Uh, but I, you know, the, those paintings that are divided up into uh, 120 by 120 um, uh, squares, I painted with these great big brushes, right? So, like I said, it's kind of a magic trick. It's kind of a shop secret for, for doing that. Uh, like I said, a lot easier than it looks. But anyway, Leo Castelli Gallery at this time was, it's where Warhol got his start, Rauschenberg, uh, all, all the, the you know, great pop artists. And if you would have told me a couple of years before that, you know, hey, in a couple of years you're going to show at the Leo Castelli Gallery, I would have said you're nuts, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, nothing, nothing was, uh, everything was within reach. I mean, it was just, here, I can tell you about this painting. This painting is called Seattle. Um, It's called Seattle because if that were a map of the United States, which it almost kind of could be with the Great Lakes up in the top right and Florida down in the bottom right, you see what I mean? Then that bright spot up in the top left, that would be Seattle, wouldn't it? There you go. Um, Pat and I, we ended up parting ways. I was her first uh, show and, and I really was, was you know, Philip Taff and I were, were her two artists throughout the 80s. And then Pat kind of, uh, as a gallery, she, she became very, very political. Um, she kind of went out of her way to, to get some, some uh, women uh, into her uh, uh, group of artists. Um, she started working with dissident artists. And she became very, very political. And now, if there's one thing my work is not, it's political. And um, and she started, she kind of went out of her way to find ways of talking about my work in a, in a, like, a, you know, to, with some notion of politics, you know, she would, some kind of political metaphor for the paintings. She would, she would try to assert meaning or content into the paintings, which, which for me, that was completely toxic. Um, and I overheard her doing that once, and, and, and I left the gallery. I left the gallery. It was time to go. Uh, this painting is um, named after a town in Ireland. I w I'd gone to Ireland on my honeymoon, and um, we went to this one town uh, called, well, it's spelled A-I-N-N-E-S-S. -S. And... Um, and it's pronounced anus. <laughs> and um, and I, none of these, very few of these paintings were titled. And this one sold to a collector who was just badgering me for like six months to title this painting. I told him, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll title it. And he just kept bugging me. And the more he bugged me, the less I wanted to title it for him. Do you know what I mean? And finally, um, I told him on the, on the telephone, I was really angry. I said, okay, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll title it after this town we visited, uh, you know, on my honeymoon, called Anus. And, and then I spelled it for him. He returned the painting, <laughs> and, um, and there was a little provenance sticker on the back, and under title, he'd, uh, he'd instead of A-I-N-N-E-S-S, -S, he'd written A-N-U-S. <laughs> uh, this one's called Nines. Uh, this was the first one. Usually in every group of paintings that I do, um, th there's one that, that is sort of the, uh, the most classic example of that group. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so this is, this is the most no-frills uh, painting from, from this particular series. This, this was, like I said, this was uh, the last show at Pat Hearns. Uh, so this is Nines. This is, uh, I think, World of Nines or Father of Nines, but you know, I had these sort of systematic. Uh, it's about the size of a door. This one, that's oil. these are oil, by the way. I 
all of a sudden, after that last show was Pat, I switched to oil paint. Um, no, no, no. These are these are just. Uh, it's a very, very simple to employ. I really like this painting. That's a picture from my my studio at at one point. Um, it's funny when I switched to, to from acrylic to oil paint. Something, yeah. You know, well, there's other things in my life that changed as well. I can tell you. I you know I left Pat Hearn. Um, her politics wasn't the only reason we parted ways. I'd also, I'd, I'd you know, I w it really, um, artists hadn't really been successful like that before. There was sort of a rock star glamour to the, to the, to that group of artists in New York at that time. Um, you know, sort of starting with, let's say, Keith Haring or Basquiat, ending with, let's say, Jeff Koons. Do you know what I mean? There was a period in there. Today, artists make a whole lot more money. But, but at that time, it was this kind of, uh, it, it, it was a, a peculiar kind of, um, of glamour. Then, then I, like I said, I switched to oil paint. I also left the gallery. I got well, strung out, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, at that time, it was the kind of success and the kind of glamour where you could afford to get strung out, or so, so I thought. Do you know what I mean? Um, and w one of my favorite so stories ab ab about that particular kind of, um, well, at this point, that particular kind of regret for me is uh, at, at one point, Andy Warhol did my portrait. He, he did this group of works where he did portraits of all these young artists. Uh, uh, Basquiat, uh, Schnabel, uh, and, and, uh, and it was my turn. He, he would trade, trade the portrait for, for a painting. So I, he picked out one of my paintings and then I went to the, the factory to, to get my portrait done. Um, you want, you want, I, I'll show it to you. I think, uh, let's see, it went up for auction recently. Anyway, so we're going to, yeah, here, the, here we go. So he does this portrait, um, does this portrait of me. And on the way into the studio, there's this crowd painting from like 1965. And uh, just, it's just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I just stopped and I went, wow, man, that's really, that's so beautiful. And he looked at me and he said, Peter, are you sure you wouldn't rather have that than the portrait? And that, that same crowd painting was at auction uh, a few months ago and, and sold for something like $17 million. And uh, I said to Andy, I said, oh, no, no, no. I thought it was going to last forever. <coughs> these are, these are, I haven't seen these in a while. These are um, uh, two paintings that I did for, uh, uh, Gen uh, for uh, Johnny Versace. He, uh, they were like, Portraits, almost. Anyway, listen, listen, let's get back to this. Uh, I'm going to, okay, that, so much for the New York stuff, okay? I think, I guess my, Andy, I have no idea what just happened. Oh, no, I do, I think, hang on. Yes, so, Andy, I got it. Um, basically those days ended, um, and, and all of a sudden, uh, yeah, all of a sudden the world got, world got a little smaller, do you know what I mean? Um, at that point in, in New York, uh, I was living at the Chelsea Hotel, um, when, when I moved in there, 
it was a place that you looked forward to moving out of. Do you know what I mean? When I first <coughs> moved in there. By the time I left, um, well, let's say the last five years that I lived in New York, my excuse for staying there was that I had such a cool pad. Um, it's because of, because of the Chelsea that I left New York five years later than I should have, you know? Um, but it was a very, uh, uh, it was a very fragrant and very interesting time. But uh, successful is not a word that I would use to describe it. Uh, it was very interesting. I, I uh, lived in the apartment. Can you see the mouse there? Uh, this was my apartment right there, those three windows. And uh, downstairs was this legendary uh, guitar store, Chelsea Guitars. You used to look out the balcony and, and see these limousines dry, drive up with these sort of big haired rock stars go in and. Uh, neck, uh, uh, anyway, th that apartment was the apartment where uh, Sid Vicious uh, stabbed Nancy. Um, my apartment was actually two suites that had been had been turned into one suite a as a result of this infamous uh, event. Uh, next door to me, my next door neighbor was Didi Ramon. I mean, it was it was an interesting, it was an interesting place to live. It was a really interesting place to live. Um, but I think at the time I kind of took it for granted. Now I, you know, since then I've I've figured out music. You know. Um, it wasn't until after I left. I, I kind of I would love to have talked to him about music. Herbert Hunky lived uh, down the hall. If you guys want to know more about Herbert Hunky, uh, you got to look him up. He was a famous old junkie. Uh, he 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 used to run with William Burroughs, but a, as a as a junkie, not as a writer or anything. Um, and then when William Burroughs became famous, Herbert kind of, you know, all the beat series with Ginsburg down there. Um, he was basically just a little, a little gonif, a little crook who, who became a, a, a cultural icon on the coattails of the, of the beats. Interesting dude, though. I loved having him down the hall. Do you know what I mean? Uh, he was like, I remember once I had a dinner party and, and uh, there were these people over and Herbert knocked on my door and he said, it's my 82nd birthday. Will you loan me 20 bucks so I can go get a bag of dope? And uh, he he heroin, um, and uh, and one of my guests says, you know, wow, it just goes to show you uh, the the the, peril the the evil that uh, heroin does. You know, <laughs> I mean, he he he'd been doing that for for what sixty odd years. You know, it's amazing. Uh, anyway, so. Um, I left the Chelsea. I moved back to Vancouver. I'd been in New York for 27 years and moved back to Vancouver. And that's where eventually I started making music, really just as a joke. There was an old guitar in my studio. And uh, it was 2007, let's say, six, 2006. Um, the Woodwards, which is basically what I've been calling myself even be since before I started writing songs, uh, it came about one day that a friend of mine and I were talking just on a lark, like, oh, if we had a rock band, what would we, what would we call it? And I wanted something with, I said, I want something with wood in the name. He suggested morning wood, um, but that had already been taken. And we were on the street, and right at that moment, in the wind wa was a, uh, uh, came flying up a, a shopping bag, a brown paper shopping bag from Woodward's department store. Now, you have to understand, Woodward's had been closed for 20 years already. And this was a brown paper, you know, one of those things you throw out. In big blue letters, it said Woodward's on, on the side. 
l like that. Is Woodward's without the. So I took out the apostrophe and put in the. But that's really what happened. It was, it was amazing serendipity. So when it came time to need a name for, for a band, it, I had one already, you know? Um, so th this is Woodward's. Woodward's was a department store that uh, closed down in the late 80s. Um, and it was squatted eventually by Vancouver's homeless. And Vancouver has a, a, a very, very serious homeless problem. And, uh, and for about this year that they squatted Woodward's, it was very successful. All of a sudden, downtown Vancouver didn't have a homeless problem. It was brilliant. But in any case, the police moved in and, and kicked everybody out. And, uh, and it became kind of a, a, a social cause. So having a name like the Woodward's, I remember we, we made t-shirts, Woodward's t-shirts, before we made music. And I remember wearing one and this girl at a coffee shop saying, hey, I hear you guys are really good. It was like that. I mean, it, in Vancouver, it, it, it's a very, very clever name. Here's a, this is Woodward's. I think it's supposed to fall down now. Okay, kind of an odd angle. I, I, di I didn't, but yeah, they blew it up. Um, they were supposed to leave a part of it, but by accident, the whole thing fell down. <laughs> um, So I moved to Holland from Vancouver. And this is like I'd learned to play some folk songs. I'd written one or two songs. Uh, and I moved to Holland, and I met this girl who was a real bona fide singer. And um, she was at the conservatory. And so you know, it wasn't that I started doing it more seriously. I just started doing it more. Um, and, and got, got kind of you know, well, got pretty good at it. Uh, she sang uh, with me. And it was through her school that I met uh, Ati Bao, who's a producer. And he heard me one day. And he heard something that I, got, I didn't really know existed. And he suggested we make a record. And, um, and that was a very serious endeavor. I didn't even know it could you know, get like that. Um, and everything changed when that happened. I, I started taking it much more seriously which has also had a very interesting impact on the paintings. Um, you know, one of the sound bites uh, is they are the paintings that I've, uh, that, that I've never been able to make or that I've always wanted to be able to make. Um, it kind of took over. The, the, the music's about me. The, the paintings are not about me. Um, the paintings are about the paintings. You know, if I'm in a bad mood, or in a good mood, I'm going to make the same painting. Um, oh, you know, hey, I got some news the other day. Check this out. Um, uh, I'm just going to go back here for a minute. This is kind of interesting, though. Oh, I haven't shown you any of the new, the new work. Um, I've just been invited. Uh, when I moved back to Vancouver, I started making these sculptures. I don't really need to say much more about that, except these. Can you kind of see those? You see what they are? What, th what they are is they're, they're um, well, those are baseball bats, but these are pencils carved in much the same way. They are uh, pencils carved into corkscrew shapes. Now, what had happened uh, just before I left New York, I got so disillusioned and so strung out that I decided I was never going to paint again. I hadn't sold a painting in God knows how long. And you know, I was broke and miserable, and, and, uh, and I basically just sat there. And just to give my hands something to do, I carved these pencils. There's, I don't know, like 300 of them or something. And um, the Whitney Museum, the Whitney Biennial, has invited me to part uh, I've been invited to participate in the 2014 Whitney Biennial, which, for those of you who don't know, 
is a bit like getting an Academy Award for an artist. It, I mean, I, my stock just, you know, two weeks ago went, uh, which is really nice. I'm kind of flush for the first time in a long, long time. But interestingly enough, this is the work that they want to show. They want to show, uh, and this may be the only work that is, is tr you know, about me. That's about me. It's, it's, uh, that's really interesting that that's what they're going to show. Um, and they asked me to write a text for the catalog, right? And, um, and I didn't know what to write about. You know, I, I went from the pencils, that, you know, then I moved to Vancouver, and I got to Vancouver, and I didn't know what the hell to do. I, wa I didn't want to make paintings. I ended up making paintings, but I didn't want to. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? And I was thinking about the pencils, because I was still making the pencils. And, uh, well, speaking of morning wood, I woke up one morning, uh, and I literally, I, I looked down. I was thinking about, what am I going to do? I was thinking about the pencils. And I looked down, and I kind of went, Eureka! You know, I'll make logs. And that's how I started, I, I started carving these big ones, you know. Right, you see? Anyway, um, back to the music. How, how much time do we have? Like, what's that? About minutes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is our first video. It's the single from the first album. Can we turn the lights off? Can we? There we go. At the end of the day, I want a woman who can swim in a Said and done, I want a girl. Gonna go far and drive her own car real fast.
I'm gonna, I, I want to show you one more uh, video. I was going to say before the lights, uh, <laughs> before the lights go back up. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how, I've never talked about the music before, so I, don't, I really, uh, really don't know what to tell you about it. I, I, I read a lot, I read a lot of poetry. I'm very interested in poetry. Um, but you should be able to figure that out from the song. What sort of music did you listen to um, that sort of informed the way you I kind of didn't. <laughs> I've never been, I've never, I've never listened to a lot of music. It certainly hasn't informed, informed me. I mean, the obvious ones, you know, John Prine or Tom Waits or, yes. Uh, how did you get your music out there? Like, how did we get our music out there? Yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting. Um, we really struggled with it. I figured, you know, if I, uh, uh, Alti, he's, he's a famous dude, you know, he's really a respected producer. And I said, okay, well, it's, I mean, it's simple math. You make a record like that, it's just, you know, word of mouth, it's, something's going to happen. Um, but it didn't. It just didn't. Um, and I wonder, I hope it's not like, like with the art world, where basically an artist makes it today by an art dealer throwing a whole bunch of money at it. Um, that's what they do. They throw money at it. Um, that's part of the materials cost, you know? Now, with this last record that we did, we've thrown some money at it. Um, if we hadn't thrown money at it, we wouldn't have been reviewed and uncut. So, I think that, I think, I think making these tactical like business like you know, investments and decisions um, and it certainly it you know it, yeah you, you, you got to throw money at it <laughs> it's, somebody has to throw money at it somebody has to throw money at it bottom line you did a kickstarter campaign we did it but that was that was for 2500 euros which really is not a lot of money in the bigger scheme of things. But it's one way to go, you know. The it, it, it is one way to go, yeah. yeah. But then you really, I think my point is not where the money comes from, but what, what you spend the money on. Because I never, we, we never thought, right, we spent a lot of money on promotion, for example. We hired somebody who for six months promoted us, uh, pushed us, sent, sent our shit out, you know. And I never would have, I never would have thought of that. I would have thought things like that happen naturally, you know, like like, like a virus. But it it doesn't. It, and the, the Kickstarter campaign had to do more with getting the word out than it did with getting the money back. Definitely. Yes. I'm interested to know. Did you actually find her? Find who? The woman. Uh, that song. Um, the first time I was ever on stage was at, at an open mic that was at this lesbian bar in, in uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> and I was really, I was so, because it was just to do that, to sing in front of people for the first time, it was, it was the best sex I'd ever had. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, I was so grateful, I wanted to write them an anthem. I wanted to write them an anthem. Uh, I was very, very much in love at the time, which you can possibly you know tell from the from the video, um, so I suppose the song's about about her in a way. Yes, yes. I for a moment I uh, absolutely I did. Yeah, yeah. I thought I did anyway. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, what was your biggest inspiration to start writing music? My biggest inspiration. Who? What? Your biggest inspiration. To start, <laughs> what motivated you to start writing music? Um, I think I just. You know, there's a lot of things where I kind of, you know, would do them and I'd go, oh, I can do this. And I, you know, I'd, I'd run with it a bit. Um, I, like I got into fencing for a while. Yeah, no, I just went, whoa, I, like I, 
you know, like it was in my genes or something. And as soon as I wrote this song as a joke, and as soon as I, I got on stage and, and sang a couple of folk songs, I kind of went, oh, I can do this. You know, this is for me. It's curious to discover it, though, at like, you know, 47 years old. And I'd, I'd never, you know, I never knew that about myself, that, that you know, I had, I had some kind of musical inclination. And Signe used to say, be grateful that you, you know, this is your little midlife little red sports car, you know. I mean, it's a fucking dream for a 54-year-old, man. It's a dream. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, shall we do, uh, do you guys want to see another video? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, should, yeah, should we do a break first and then do some songs? Uh, I think just go. Sorry. Just go? Okay. Can you uh, do the lights? So this is the, um, the first single from, uh, from our new album, um, which... Uh, yeah, yeah. What? I didn't know shit from Shino. I didn't have a clue. I didn't see a gun. I told her I don't know you at all. There's another one, that, that one, I don't want to play that one now, but that, that, that video there, you can check it out, it's called 20 Toes, it's, an, it's another video from a, of a song from this album. Um, and Martin, the guy who made the one that you just saw, he, uh, he we just shot another one, uh, another video, so it'll be out in a few weeks. So keep posted. Yes? Is the album a full story, or? No, it's just it's just the last uh, 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 you know selection of, of recent songs. He, here it is, by the way. It's a you see what it is? It's a big match package, and it uh, it opens up like this. If you line the matches up just right, it looks empty. People go, oh, but there's no CD. <laughs> but it's kind of a nice package. Design that as well. uh, I, I, I thought of it, but no, it is uh, actually a couple of designers uh, designed it. Um, and, uh, yeah. 
Uh, and we have, uh, we got a bunch of po uh, uh, postcards here of our tour poster, which is sort of a story in itself, but it, it's, and it speaks for itself, so, but you're welcome to them. Yes? Uh, Tom Waits would be inspiration. Yeah, I suppose in a, in a really, in a kind of, yeah, I, I mean, I admire him uh, very, very much, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, he's very Tom Waits, for me anyway. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, some of it, sure, yeah, yeah. And the way I like the way he tells a story, the way he's able to tell a story, and and I believe him. I haven't always believed him, but I think he's he's sort of become the real McCoy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think he's uh, I think he's the real McCoy. Uh, yeah. Yes. Is music like a serious thing to you now? Is sure. Yeah. Like yeah. It seems to be. I mean, it. You know, there's other people involved now, so you know, yeah, it's a serious thing for for several of us, you know, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Yes? Have you ever thought of doing your own album? No, I, no, I, I really, and, and honestly, if you would have asked me two years ago to, to, to combine, you know, the art and, and the music in, in one, any context, I would have refused. Like I, I really, I, I did not want to be seen as a, a music making artist or an art making musician, uh, because whenever I hear that personally, I don't trust it. Not as far as I can throw it, you know. Um, like you got those guys who, who you know, they're famous for one thing and then they do another thing, and yeah, I don't, I rarely believe it. <laughs> you, you prefer to have separate on their own merit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, and, and that meant so much to me that that uh, uh, that for Ati, my art had absolutely like no relevance at all. You know, and, uh, I could have in you know back in New York if I was making music, I could have. I was really good friends with Hal Wilner, one of the one of the you know most famous producers in the world, and he would have sat down with me for a couple of days in the studio if I'd asked him, but but on the on the merit of either a friendship or my art career, you know? Uh, and I, other artists have done that. No, I want it, I, yeah. And, you, you know, I, I was friends with, with Don Van Fleet a bit, uh, Captain Beefheart, and uh, Michael Verner, a, a legendary art dealer, said to, to Don, said, look, if you really, who was a marvelous painter, he, he was really a marvelous painter, and, and for, for most of the later part of his life, it's more or less exclusively what he did. But, uh, you know, he kind of gave up music entirely because it was the only way he was going to be taken seriously, as, like really seriously as a painter, you know? How many songs do you want us to sing? How many songs have you got? <laughs> uh, way too many. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you want us to sing? Yeah, like four. Three or four strips. Okay then. Oh, yes, yes. Never been done, or we were the first, we were a burrito. 
me. You didn't see me coming, I got dark before five on me. Please don't go away to me. Please don't go away. Oh, what would I do? Always the same, here we go again We was dreaming But we got it dark It took a couple of weeks We was fine We were slowing down Someone called the police It was time to go for a minute Oh please baby go away So for a couple of weeks, we fall asleep on the floor. We was smoking. Got the heat turned up, the lights turned down. When we hit the spot on another day, we had something to drink. We was hot to go for a minute. Oh, please, let's go away. Oh, no, no way, I'll go there 
ever again. And heave and I, ho, 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 I give a best to say. Yes, 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 but it doesn't get better. There is a season, a turn, 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 turn for every day. Burn, 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 burn every day. I say, hey, 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 stay off of my back. There's no bit of wheeze by some crazy jackass. Your mother has your father say, please, please, please. It's always an urge, urge, urge of the birds and not be easy. I walk in with doo 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 run, 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 run away from her love and blah, 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 she always has something to say. I want more, 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 it ain't never enough. I take a deep breath there, puff, 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 a cigarette, I cough, cough, cough. I go, oh, 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 little walk by that beach. Girls, 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 talk each to each other, I get around, around, around. around. La 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 la, sing along with me. Oh, row, 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 you go from Beverly. There is a season, turn, 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 for every day. Burn, 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 Thank you. We are, we are, we're playing at the Continental on the Sirius. And, uh, right? Yes. Saturday the 30th. Saturday the 30th. Take some postcards there for you and just maybe negotiate about the CDs. <laughs> <laughs> okay.